one man made all the difference. His approach was unlike any other, and he gave us a brand new perspective. Evidence of his humanity was undeniable, and his love translated into an unwavering trust. He brought value and dignity to all those around him. His commitment to live a life of love has forever changed our eternity. Simply put, Jesus has changed everything. Let me begin by reminding you that next week here at Southeast is the weekend when we typically focus on Good Friday and, and what Jesus did at Calvary. And I know that's traditionally Palm Sunday, but we, we do that that week before. At all of our campuses, we have uh, an extended communion time. Uh, we take the Lord's Supper down at the steps or in a hallway, and it's a very powerful time, and so I hope you'll be a part of that next week. Then the following week, two weeks from this weekend, is Easter, and I want to make certain that you check your campus service times. Uh, we have over 40 different worship services over the course of three uh, different days. Last year, we had over 50,000 people who attended a, an Easter service, and that's significant because in the months that followed, our attendance jumped about 500 people. And that means that there are people who are open and they just need to be invited. They just need to be shown by you that you care about them. Now, this is a time when people are more open to that invitation than any other time of the year. And many of them have not been in church for a number of years because of maybe a bad experience they had. For others, they just, they just don't go to church and don't have a relationship with the Lord. And for some of you, it's very natural for you to connect them and to in invite them and uh, say, come and see what's taking place. At every one of our campuses, we have postcards, we have all sorts of things, we have all the service times on the back, and it's real easy for you to pick up some of those today, and then just to hand those out to people that you come in contact with, and be praying about that. I want to encourage you to come on a, a service that maybe most people wouldn't tend to come to, so that you can free up space uh, for our guests on, on those other hours. But this all ties in because we've been in a series looking at the life of Jesus Christ and we've been seeing who it is that he is and some of the distinctive characteristics which make him stand out from every other leader, every other public figure. And scripture is going to show us today Jesus' unorthodox way that he treated people. And as he does, uh, as we see in his life, I want you to be thinking about Easter and I want you to be thinking about the people that you can have an influence on and invite. Because our temptation is to think, well, we've, we've done all we can. We've invited everybody that we can in, within our circle of influence. But today, Jesus is going to expand that circle. And my prayer is that today, God will open your eyes to the potential impact that you can make when you begin to view others the way that Jesus did. So let's see some unorthodox ways that, that Jesus viewed people and how he treated them with love. And let's begin with the backdrop where Jesus contrasts the way society normally interacts with people and how he encourages his followers to, to be different and not to follow the crowd. So the first way that we see is to love those who disagree with you. Jesus did. Jesus is always pointing out ways that his followers would be significantly different than the rest of the culture. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfect. Jesus says, even the unrighteous, he says, even those who are far, far away from God, even those people are in the habit of, of loving others who love them. That's pretty basic. But being a Christ follower is anything but basic. 
It's about being distinctive. It's built on a foundation of love, a love that expresses everyone has value and everyone can be used by God, even those people who disagree with you. And nowadays, we run into a lot of people who have very sharp disagreements. We are living in a world that is politically polarized. We are a divided nation. We talk about love where you are. Sometimes we think, well, we, we, we've loved everyone where we are, but the reality is sometimes we think it means love, love those who believe the same way you believe. Or, or love your friends where you are. Or love people who are nice to you. Or love where you are if they love you first. But my hunch is that there is someone who opposes you. There is someone who disagrees with you in sharp fashion. And yet your job is to love them. Here's a second way that, that Jesus treated people. He loved those who were disadvantaged. That's what he did. And throughout the gospel, we see Jesus interacting with so many people who had some struggle, some emotional or physical disadvantage or difficulty that life had dealt them. And he, he didn't, didn't do this in order to enhance his position in society. In fact, it brought ridicule from others. He just genuinely cared about people. I want you to envision the, the lineup of people that would be there to see Jesus when he would start healing people in a town. Just, just imagine it, all of this ragtag team that were just like his disciples, a ragtag team, but they were people that were struggling with something significant. Think about when you go to a doctor's office and you sit in the doctor's waiting room and you're surrounded by a whole bunch of sick people and you're sick. And you don't want to sit too close to the people beside you because you're like, oh, I might get what they've got, right? Well, that's how it was for, for Jesus each and every day. This lineup of people that was right there wanting his time, wanting, wanting a healing from him. These were the people who were often overlooked and ostracized by society. But Jesus, he genuinely cared about them. I guess it was about four years ago that was the first time that Tim Tebow ever came to Southeast and, and spoke. And while he was, was here, uh, we stumbled onto uh, his love that he has for people with special needs and people who are going through some battle and some physical challenge. And, and Tim's executive director of his foundation, Eric Dellenbeck, was there with him. And we got to talking about some of their ideas. And I shared with him what we do with our our Shine event every fall, where we have basically a prom for uh, people who have some type of special needs or, or disability. And that resonated with them, and they had been talking about putting together something like that. And so they sent their entire team down to shadow our team that fall at our event, spend time with our disability staff, and spend time with Mary Tatum, who oversees that ministry. And they got a lot of their ideas, and then Mary helped them put together a manual that they could use for their foundation, for their events that they wanted to do around Valentine's Day for years to come. We put them in touch with Southland Christian Church right down the road in, in Lexington, who was the first church to ever do something like this. And we began to work alongside of them and, and help them on that project. And they had their first one the next February. They just two months ago had their third event. And to say that uh, with Tim's creativity and influence alongside of it and so many different things that they have added to it, uh, it has grown exponentially. And in February, they were in 375 churches in 11 countries, 28 different denominations having nights to shine all over the globe, over 60,000 people with special needs were there that night. Uh, and every one of them left that church or that community center realizing that they had value, that they were loved by God. You see, in God's kingdom, each of those people have worth. In God's economy, those who are physically disadvantaged are loved by God just as much as, as someone who seemingly has no physical or emotional challenges. And yet we all recognize that we all do. Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, 
When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. And although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I'm here to tell you that the gates of heaven are handicap accessible. But the second you pass through those gates and you see Jesus, you are changed instantly. You have a glorious body, a glorified body. You are changed. There are no infirmities. There is no sickness. There is no disease. There is no paralysis. My dad was in the service here last night as I preached this, and I didn't have it in my notes. And as I'm preaching, uh, I just just feel, I, I just re- realize and recognize that my dad is right there in the front row. And I just stopped and I just said, I'm so thankful to have a dad who modeled for me how to treat people who oftentimes others overlook. My dad's been a great leader for decades uh, in ministry and Christian circles in the evangelical world. And everybody sees my dad as a leader. But I see my dad as a servant. And I watched how he, he cared for my disabled uncle. I watched time and time again. Every year at Thanksgiving, our home would be filled with people that everybody else would overlook and they had nowhere to go uh, for a holiday meal. And my mom and dad would have them to our house. Do you love people? with disabilities where you are. I bet if you ask God to open your eyes, and I, I, I just imagine the next two weeks you will meet some people with some different disabilities or disadvantages who need the hope this Easter that only Christ can give. And the question will be, do you love the disadvantaged just when we have a big church event like Shine? Or will you love them now and give them a smile and a hug and an invitation to be part of Easter. Mark Twain said, kindness is the language the deaf can hear and the blind can read. Well, here's a third way that Jesus loved. He loved those who were different than us. Loved those who are different than us. Jesus did. You probably are aware by this point in the message that Jesus was no respecter of persons. He loved everyone equally. He, he served equally. So Jesus loved the sick. You have to think back in Jesus' day, leprosy would have had a similar stigma to maybe what AIDS or HIV had in in the 1980s in America. And when Jesus walked the earth, leprosy was a a disease that's still around in some parts of the world where if you got even a spot of, of leprosy on your body, it was just a matter of time before your whole body would be covered with it. It was an infectious, it was a contagious skin disease and You would have to leave and move and leave your family and go to a leper colony and live out your life there. When you would choose to leave the colony to go someplace, if if they went somewhere, they all went together and wherever they went, they would shout at the top of their voices, unclean, unclean. And if you were out in the marketplace and then you, you heard that unclean being shouted, you would grab your kids wherever they might be, you'd corral them together and you'd walk on the other side of the street because you weren't about to take a chance of coming in contact with someone who had leprosy. If somehow we could factor it, we would have to say that that these individuals, when it came to self-worth, they ranked in the negative numbers. But in Mark chapter one, verses 40 and 41, when everybody else is staying away from them, look what happens. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Notice something. When when they come on the scene, when the lepers come on the scene, Jesus doesn't run. Jesus stays right there. And notice something else. When Jesus heals this man, Before he heals him, he does something. He touches him. Can you imagine that? This man with leprosy has not been touched by anyone. 
unless they had leprosy for who knows how many years. But Jesus always does things the extra mile. And so rather than just speaking a word of healing, instead he chooses to touch him. And then he heals him. That's the way Jesus did it. That's the way he reached out to others. Maybe you need to give a touch to someone. Maybe it's a pat on the back. Maybe it's an arm about the shoulder. Maybe it's a high five. Maybe it's a fist bump from an older teammate that makes you feel valued. Maybe it's your spouse who holds your hand in spite of the disagreement that you've had or who touches you in an effort to rekindle the love that you once had. But Jesus doesn't stop with the touch. He heals the person. Everyone else was intimidated and scared of this man. Not Jesus. The sick. How about the rich? Jesus reached out to those who were rich. We see it time and time again throughout the the scriptures. He wasn't rich. The Bible says the Son of Man did not have a place to lay his head. And yet he interacted and built friendships with those who were wealthy. Have you ever been in one of those settings where you, you just realize that you're in over your head and you're out of your league? Maybe you pull up at a party and every car that's beside you is brand new and expensive and you're like, wow, we look at this. You ever walk in a place and your jaw just kind of drops down? I, I spoke at a, at a hotel uh, for an event a few months ago and Beth and I stayed there and it, it, they put us up in this posh hotel. I'm telling you what, I'd never seen anything like it. And I walked in the room and it was, incredible. it's the kind of hotel room where you're stockpiling the shampoo. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Grab that soap, baby, get that soap, all right? <laughs> Don't judge me, all right? They had a sewing kit. They had a little sewing kit on the bathroom counter. I don't sew. I don't know the first thing about sewing, right? But I'm like, hey, we're getting that sewing kit, right? (laughs) So, I mean, they had everything. They had white robes, his and her white robes in the closet. They had slippers by our bed, fresh slippers every single night. I've never worn slippers in my life. I did then, you know? (laughs) Thought I was being a good steward. But when we walked around the the hotel... um, I went in, into the bathroom, there's a bathroom counter there, there's a shower house, and then they have a little private room for the, the bathroom, and I look, and there's a telephone on the wall. I'm thinking, this is awesome. And so I did what any guy would do. I closed the door, and I called my wife on her cell phone. <laughs> and of course, she doesn't recognize the number, so it keeps ringing and ringing, and finally she picks up and reluctantly says, hello. I said, hey, baby, how are you? She said, where are you? I thought you went to the bathroom. I said, just sitting here thinking of you. (laughs) You got to keep a little spark in that marriage, you know? But it's like a, a lifestyle of the rich and famous, right? Now, if you've studied the Gospels, you're aware that Jesus had a number of affluent friends. He had Lazarus, who we talked about last week, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Nicodemus, Matthew, the tax collector, Zacchaeus. But here's the thing. He looked beyond their possessions to determine what was their priority in life because to him, that was all that mattered. Do you ever look at the wealthy and think, oh, they, they, they'd never come to Easter with me? Do you just assume that because they have everything they need physically that they have everything that they need spiritually? I guarantee you, for many of them, there is a hole in their soul that only Jesus Christ can fill. And you have the boldness to invite them to experience hope and see what Jesus does. Jesus loved the sick, he loved the rich, Jesus loved the poor. He talked a great deal about the poor. In Luke chapter 21, verses one through four, there's this this really cool moment. They're outside the temple treasury And they're kind of observing what what all is taking place, the disciples with Jesus. It says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all of the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. You see, Jesus noticed someone that no one else did. And it's not that the gifts of the rich or the middle class weren't valuable. It's that the gift of the poor woman was also valuable, maybe even more so, because Jesus knew the story behind it. 
And he knew the amount of sacrifice that it represented. It was all that she had. And Jesus' ministry makes it clear whether you're poor or rich, the kingdom of God is for you. And if that's the case, there's, room, there's, there's no room for us to discriminate against those who are different from us for any reason. Jesus sure didn't. Here's what's significant. Jesus saw both extremes the same in his eyes and he valued both equally. But we have a tendency to take shots at the opposite extreme in which we find ourselves. And so we take shots at those who have a whole lot more than us if we don't feel like we have much. And we take shots at those who have a whole lot less than us and we question their work ethic and all sorts of different things when really, let's be honest, a lot depends on what family God puts you in. A few weeks ago, I was uh, invited to be a special guest at a, at a fundraising event for a Christian ministry out of state, and I, I, I was in out of my league. I've been to a lot of different things like this, but there were celebrities all around, and I didn't know how the auction was gonna go, but they started auctioning off different things. Every dollar went toward this Christian ministry. And it's a great ministry, and they had a girl come up that was uh, the winner of uh, a super chef competition on TV. And they said, she will cook a meal for you at your house. Who will start the bidding? I'm thinking, wow, I bet you somebody will pay 500 bucks to have that gal make a Pop-Tart in her house, you know? Well, it didn't go for 500 bucks. It went for $50,000. I'm thinking, what is she serving, you know? <laughs> And these numbers, they just kept escalating all throughout this entire auction. And, and the higher the numbers got, my nose was itching, but I was not about to scratch it. <laughs> I just sat there because I was not about to bid, right? But they had one gal who's in a pretty well-known singing group. And Scott Van Pelt from ESPN was the auctioneer. And he said, okay, what, what, what we pay to have her do a concert at, at your home for your family? It went for $140,000. And I sat there, and this was my first thought. My first thought was, how, how do people get that type of disposable money to, to give? How, how, how can they just do that? That really wasn't my first thought. My first thought was, how can I slide my mortgage note on my house into the auction list, you know? <laughs> Dave is here. He will cook a meal for you and preach on your favorite text, you know? <laughs> But I came back to, once again, how do people have this kind of disposable money? But then I realized something. That's the wrong question. Everyone who was there gave or bought something. They, they overpaid an exorbitant amount, and they did so for a reason. Why'd they do it? They could have spent their money on something self-serving. They could have done something that would fade, but instead they wanted to advance the cause of Christ. And then I realized that they weren't paying for a meal, they were giving to a ministry. They weren't purchasing a, a, a concert ticket, they were investing in a mission that they believed deeply in. And Satan has a heyday trying to get those of wealth to mock those who are less fortunate and to get those who are poor to take shots at those who are rich. But in a culture and in a church and in a community, we need both and we need both groups to bloom where they're planted, to love where they are, within their sphere of influence, to be a positive light on behalf of Jesus Christ and make a difference for him. For within the body of Christ, you'll find that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus wants us to be servants. Jesus wants us to reach out to the sick, to the rich, to the poor. Basically, he's saying to anyone, let me talk about one last group, and that's the desperate. Can you reach out and get out of your comfort zone and stretch yourself and reach out to those who are desperate. There's nothing like a person who in desperation hits rock bottom and they look upward and say, okay, Lord, I give, I surrender. I'm gonna stop fighting against you. I'm gonna stop running from you. I, I just turn my life over to you. And in desperation, they make that commitment. Now, there's always some risk involved whenever you you reach out to love desperate people. In Mark chapter five, there's a story of where Jesus does so. They're actually on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus says, hey, we, we need to go to the other side. 
And they're like, okay, I wonder what's over there, but we'll go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they went to this area where no one went. It was an area that had these cliffs and these mountains, and it was called the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes. It's called two different names. And there was a reason people didn't go there. It's because there was very little there. It kind of opened the doorway to 10 other towns and cities called the Decapolis. But right there, it was filled with a demon-possessed man who lived in some caves. You say, well, how would you know that? Everybody knew it. Because around the, with the configuration of the Sea of Galilee, when, whenever he would come out of his cage and he would scream in torment, everyone heard it off of that water. Didn't matter where you were. They tried to bind him, but he was too strong and they couldn't subdue him. They had chained him. He broke through the chains. He would cut himself with rocks all day long. He would scream at the top of his lungs. He was naked. And that's where Jesus chooses to go. Gets out of the boat, walks out of the boat, and here comes this wild man out of the caves running down to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, come, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And the man yells at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? We pick it up with verse nine. Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And Jesus gave them permission and the impure spirits came out of him and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they were drowned. And the next paragraph tells us that this man sat down with Jesus and the disciples in his right mind, clothed, and had a conversation. What changed? Well, he'd come in contact with Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus didn't, didn't run when he came. I would have run if I saw a demon-possessed man running at me. Not Jesus. One preacher taught on this passage and he entitled his sermon, The Nude Dude in a Rude Mood. <laughs> Verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with Jesus. But Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So this man pleads with Jesus, I, 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 I wanna share with you, I wanna travel with you. That tells us something about the man. He, he was evangelistic, he wanted to share what had happened, his dramatic transformation. And Jesus says no, and doesn't let him go with him. You see, Jesus was no ordinary preacher. Any other preacher would say, hey, this will be great. We'd love to have you, but not Jesus. Jesus was not going to turn this man into a novelty act. He wants his family and his friends and the region to experience the transformation that's taken place in this man's life. I mean, think about it. Everywhere Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee, everybody came out by the droves. Jesus goes to the garrisons. Nobody comes but one demon-possessed man. Jesus says, go tell people. You see, I think there was a reason behind why Jesus said we need to go to the other side. The disciples are thinking, this is crazy. We came all the way over here. We had one healing and we had one guy who now wears clothes. Was it worth the trip, right? Well, it was. Because let me tell you the rest of the story. Six to nine months later, Jesus comes back to the Decapolis area. He's fed 5,000 people in another part of the region. Now he comes back to this Gadarene area near the Decapolis, and this time there are 4,000 people that show up, and they want to hear his teaching. Why did they show up? Because they were amazed that this man had gone out and taught and told them about the difference Jesus had made. They said, if he made that type of a difference in that guy's life, I wonder what he can do in my life. And Jesus ends up feeding 4,000 different people, but the story doesn't stop there. Because after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and after he ascends to heaven, 
There comes this time in the next few decades of a time of intense persecution by Rome. And Rome tries to snuff out Christianity. And they do everything they can to destroy churches and, and so the people can't meet together. But guess what? There was a church that popped up over in the Gerasenes area. And the Romans didn't bother to go over there because of the stigma that it had always had for decades. And so they didn't go. And so for 300 years, that church thrived and people came to Christ in the midst of oppression because the Romans never went there. Why? All because Jesus went across the water to reach out to someone who was very different than him that no one else would give the time of day. I wonder who you could reach out to. You see, Jesus was constantly reaching out to others. He had conversations with an ambitious lawyer, an adulterous woman, a doubting disciple, a money-hungry tax collector, a wealthy ruler, a poor single mom, a criminal on a cross, an unclean woman in a crowd, a paralyzed man, a foreign woman walking to get water. You want to be great? Love people the way Jesus loved them. Love those who are disadvantaged, who are different, and who disagree with you. Let's show the world that we love them. Let's tell them of the difference Jesus has made in our lives. And let's invite them to be a part of our Easter celebration so that we can give them hope through our resurrected Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, in your word you tell us you say, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we, we see you in need? When did we see you sick? When did we see you in prison? And the king replies, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. And so, Lord, will you help us to have eyes like Jesus? And will you help us to see people for who they can become through you rather than for who they are right now? May we see their potential rather than their problems. And it's the powerful name of the one who specializes in transformations, Jesus Christ, that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.